Greetings in the highest, holiest name under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved. This is Brother Mike Brown greeting you with sanctifying truth. This is February 19th, 2019. This will be episode 23. We thank God for this privilege to be able to bring the words of the living God to you once again. And today we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse number 31. And we're going to be looking at how God deals with our sins, the believer's sins. Not the sinner's sins, but the believer's sins. Now, since God is holy and no sin is allowed in his presence, he doesn't allow his children to continue in sin with impunity. Paul asked the question in Romans chapter 6, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? That is, after we're saved by the grace of God, that grace may abound that the grace of God would not help us through our sins and get the victory over the sins of our flesh. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace, the grace of God, may abound? Answer, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? My friend, if you have been buried with Jesus Christ, buried in the likeness of his burial, and risen to walk in newness of life by the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you have no uh, legal right to continue in sin that grace may abound as a child of God. We do not have uh, the privilege or the we shouldn't have the desire to. Now, he dwells in the children, in the believer's heart or his spirit, in the person of the Holy Spirit of Christ. The believer has been set apart or sanctified by the indwelling spirit of God. He can no longer live the way he did before his new birth nor should he want to. If a supposed Christian can say that he got saved and returns to the hog pen of sin and not be chastened of the Lord until he gets right with God, he has never been saved according to the book. My friend, in Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son came home to the Father's house when he came unto himself. And child of God, the Holy Spirit of God is going to bring you to yourself. He's going to bring you to the end of that weight and the sin that does so easily beset you. Sooner or later, it's coming. You might as well go ahead and give up and give in to the Holy Spirit of God. And my friend, obtain the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, and have joy unspeakable and full of glory, and have a true heart, an honest heart before God. The carnal Corinthians were rebuked and warned by Paul more than any of the New Testament churches concerning their sexual sins and abuse of the gifts of the Spirit, especially speaking in tongues, which is the easiest of the gifts to counterfeit in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. So the Apostle Paul reams the carnal Corinthians out numerous times. And my friend, we'd do well to take heed to the words of the living God that I'm about to give you. These are not my words. These are God's preserved, inerrant, plenary words. 
word for word, preserved, inspired, and preserved by the Holy Spirit of God. Now, if you don't believe that, then you can just cut me off and forget it and go on your merry way because nothing matters. If the book is not God's book, if the authorized King James Bible is not his inspired, preserved words, nothing else matters. So just eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 30. Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Now, my friend, that's a commandment from God. Colossians three seventeen. And whatsoever ye do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Ecclesiastes 2.24, Solomon says, There is nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink, and that he should make his soul enjoy good, in his labor. This also I saw that it was from the hand of God. For who can eat or who else can hasten hereunto more than I? For God giveth to a man that is good in his sight wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner he giveth travail to gather and to heap up, listen, that he may give to him that is good before God. This also is vanity and vexation of spirit. <clears throat> My friend Paul says, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, that covers everything in life, naturally and spiritually. He says you do it all to the glory of God. This is the acid test. My friend, if anything that we do causes another brother or a lost person to stumble, it's a sin against God. You can write that down. The acid test is found in Romans chapter 14, beginning in verse 13, where we read, Let us not therefore judge one another, anymore. Now we'll get to judgment in just one second. I know you think I'm judging you, but my friend, I'm fixing to show you that I'm judging righteous judgment by the book. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. All of you dear saints out there that love to say, don't judge me and judge not that you be not judged. My friend, listen, Paul says, you better be concerned with putting a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in your brother's way. Consider it. What comes out of your mouth and the actions that you do, you perform with the members of your body. You better make sure they're not a stumbling block that causes a weak brother to fall away from God. Romans 14, 14, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably, destroy not him with thy meat, for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of, for the kingdom of God, 
that's the righteous, moral, invisible kingdom we're born into by the new birth, not the kingdom of heaven, which does come with observation. The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, but is within your heart. Luke 17, 20. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither, neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, number one, or is offended, two, or is made weak, number three. Hast thou faith, here it is, have it to thyself before God, Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. You want to know whether or not your physical carnal habit is sin? Does your heart condemn you over it? My friend, does the Holy Spirit of God who dwells in your heart condemn you over it? Or does he allow you that thing that you are doing. And that thing, my friend, if it's if you're condemned over it and you go ahead and do it anyway and it causes your brother to, to stumble, be offended, or weakens his faith in God, you are sinning against God. That's the acid test. Romans 14, 23, And he that doubteth, is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. If you're not 100% sure that the thing that you are doing is okay with God, if you don't, if it, the scripture doesn't condemn it and the Holy Spirit doesn't condemn it, then it's all right. We're talking about questionable things. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Can you do it by faith? Or my friend, does the word of God condemn it? Or does the Holy Spirit of God in your heart condemn it? Now Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 is one of Satan's favorite verses. And if you carnal Christians haven't learned but one verse. I'm sure you've got, you've got this one down. Judge not that you be not judged, right? Okay, now again, I told you all ago, I'm not judging you. I'm giving you the words of the living God in hopes that it will help you. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Do you love him? If you love him, my friend, you're willing to lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset you. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. 1 Corinthians 2.11 For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. 
which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. That's how we study the book. Here a little, there a little, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Isaiah chapter 28, 1 Corinthians 2, 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. The things of the Spirit of God, in the Word of God, those things are spiritually discerned. It takes the Spirit of God to reveal them unto us. Do you have spiritual discernment? 1 Corinthians 2.15, But he that is spiritual, here it is, judgeth all things. Yet he himself is judged of no man. Why is he not judged of no man? My friend, because he's living right before God. He's walking in the light as he, God, is in the light. And he has no occasion of stumbling in him. He that is spiritual judgeth all things. Now, how does he judge all things? By the book and by the teaching of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit and the Holy Book is all you need to judge all things things. And then you'll come to conclusion with your little acid test, what's right or wrong. And then my friend, when the Spirit of God teaches us what is wrong, we're to line up with him. Okay? And then the re remainder of our life, that thing not never creep back in again. And if it does, then we get down on our prayer bones and we confess it to God again. Say, God, it defeated me again. And plead the precious blood of Christ over it. Over and over and over until you mature enough to get the victory over it. John seven twenty four. The Lord Jesus Christ speaking. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. That's how we are to judge. Now, my friend, Gentiles are not bound to the Jewish dietary laws of Leviticus 11, but they are a good start on the health of your body which if you are saved is the temple of the Holy Ghost. You can read Le Leviticus chapter 11, those Jewish dietary laws. My friend, pork, for instance, is an abomination to those Jews. To this day, they will not eat it. And if anybody knows it causes high blood pressure. It's hard to digest. I can't digest it. I don't eat it. Uh, fish over there must have... Uh, scales and fins. Uh, catfish don't have scales, my friend. Abomination before God. Catfish is not good for you. I used to love fried catfish. I can't eat it anymore because of my health. And you do well, no matter what your age is, to line up with some of those uh, recommendations that you see in Leviticus chapter 11. So, the believer's body is the temple of the Holy Ghost or Spirit. Same person. Sometimes he's called the Holy Spirit. Sometimes he's called the Holy Ghost. Same person, third person of the Trinity. 1 Corinthians 3.16 Know ye not... Paul says to the carnal Christians, he asks, always asking them these questions. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? 
God no longer dwells in that ark, in the temple, my friend, of Solomon's temple. They don't even have a temple anymore. The Romans destroyed it in 70 AD. God dwells in the believer's temple, the believer's body, the spirit. He dwells in the the believer's spirit. We're made in the image of God, body, soul, and spirit. If you've never been saved by the grace of God, your spirit is still dead. And my friend, God, the Holy Ghost does not dwell in you yet. You must be born again for him to purge you of that unclean spirit that controls your dead spirit. 1 Corinthians 3.17 If any man defile the temple of God, that's the believer's body, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now listen to me. Defile and destroy are translated from the same Greek word. So if any man destroy the temple of God, him shall God destroy. God will help you out, my friend, whether you're saved or lost. If you choose to go down the road of, let's say, sucking on those cancer sticks, you are destroying your body. And God's going to beat that stuff out of you. God will help you destroy it himself. <clears throat> we are to flee sexual immorality. The carnal Corinthians uh, had many problems with their sexual sins. And this last day is led to see in church is returning right back to the carnal Corinthian era. My friend, there's more sexual perversion going on today in the last day's church. You don't know whether the people are saved or lost. There's pedophiles, there's sodomites, every kind of adultery, everything going on in these mega churches. My friend, it's abomination to God. And the bigger the church is, the more sexual activity you have. Amen, amen, and amen. That's the triune amen. 1 Corinthians six twelve, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient or necessary. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any, Paul says. In other words, I'm going to take this stinking cigarettes, these pack of cigarettes, and I'm going to wad them up and I'm going to throw them away. They're not going to have power over me. This bottle of uh, beer, wine, whiskey, whatever it is, the pills, whatever it is, the sex, the pornography, if it's got power over you and you're a child of God, my friend, you're living under the privilege of God. And the Lord Jesus Christ has the power to give you the victory over any sin. 1 Corinthians 6, 13, meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. The physical body belongs to God. It's his possession, and it's not for fornication. And God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. Resurrection power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Now get this and get it good. Shall I then take the members of Christ, that is your body, and make them the members of an harlot, God forbid. What? Know you not that he which is joined 
to an harlot is one body, for two, saith he, shall be one flesh. And then, my friend, they have offspring. One flesh produces offspring, married or not. 1 Corinthians six seventeen. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. It's Holy Spirit joining. Holy Spirit baptism. 1 Corinthians ten thirteen. The Bible says, Wherefore, as by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether it be Jew or Gentile, whether it be bond or free, and have been made all to drink into one Spirit. Now get 1 Corinthians six eighteen. Flee fornication. My friend, you know what Joseph did? He fled from Potiphar's wife. He fleed fornication. And you do yourself a great favor, my friend, to flee from it. Because if you, if you submit to it, you're going to pay an awful price. And it'll be uh, years and years upon years of coming. The Bible says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Flee it. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body, and you will reap that sin in your own body body. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own, you're God's possession, for you're bought with a price. That's the precious blood of Christ. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. There's no question about it, my friend, when it comes uh, to sin, whether you're, going, whether you're going to do it or not. You might as well go ahead and say, I belong to God. And by God's grace, I'm not going to do this great wickedness. And my friend, run out of your coat like Joseph did. He left his coat of many colors in Potiphar's wife's hands. He lost his coat, but he didn't lose his character, my friend. <clears throat> so, let's go back to this. The food we ingest should be scrutinized and questioned. Is what I am eating and drinking going to glorify God? Is it going to be good fuel for physical energy, or is it going to weaken my body and rob me of my energy that I could use to serve God? The carnal Corinthians had to be rebuked by Paul because they were eating things offered to idols, and those uh, lost people were being weakened by them. Here is Christians eating things that they know have been offered to the idols of Corinth. God's people today are eating and drinking the same diet that the world does. How is it working out for you, my friend? How is it working out? A rich diet, my friend, will lead to a, a pale, poor, weakened body. The majority of health issues could be controlled or cured with two things, the right diet and exercise. I'm living proof of this fact. If I wanted to die a horrible, painful death, all I would have to do is eat what the majority of the world does, and it would put me in the ground in no time. Friend, I have an inflammatory bowel disease 
called Crohn's, C-R-O-H-N-S. It is predominantly passed on in family genes. Western culture, diet, my friend, just about finished me off many times through Crohn's inflammation flares. Were it not for the grace of God, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you right now. I've lost a third of my large colon as a result of this horrible disease. Through decades of living with this thorn in my flesh, I've learned what I can and cannot eat and drink. And by the way, I just learned today that a first cousin of mine passed away with Crohn's. It is uh, in the family genes. 56 years old, first cousin. The last conversation I had with him was about the Lord and his diet. I warned him that if he didn't change his diet, he would not continue living very much longer. Crohn's would finish him off, and I hate to say it, but I was right. Now, my friend, Crohn's is an extreme example of what an unchecked diet can lead to, but none are exempt from the results of abusing the temple of your body through diet and unchecked lust that war against the soul. You take, for instance, sugary drinks, caffeine, uh, milk, dairy products, ice cream, alcoholic beverages, Anything that robs you of your body's energy will ultimately cool your desire to live for, serve, and glorify God. I'm telling you, my friend, if you don't have physical strength, you're not going to have spiritual strength. You may say you are nuts and extremists trying to force your diet and religion on me. Well, let me ask you, how is it going with you when you are sick and can't get out of bed or worse, have to be hospitalized and operated on because you are killing yourself with a fork and a glass? My friend Paul warned the carnal Corinthians for their own good, not as a Pharisee. The Christian should examine everything he eats and drinks, and then, my friend, pray over it and ask God to bless it. By the way, can you bow your head? Whatever it is, whether you eat or drink, whatever it is, can you bow your head and say, God, will you bless this for the strength and nourishment of my body? Can you say, God, will you bless this cigarette? Will you bless this can of beer here, this cocktail drink? Will you bless all this wickedness I'm about to do? You know good and well you can't. The Christian should examine what he's doing, everything that he eats and drinks. Is this going to be medicinal food or for my detriment? Our food should be our medicine. And if it is, you may not need the pharmaceuticals. Amen, amen, and amen. So whatsoever, this covers everything else that a Christian does after he has maintained his body for optimum health with his diet. It takes discipline. It takes the power of God. The energy we obtain through the right diet should be channeled to the aim of service to God that will glorify Him. It should not be used to be spent on the things of the world. 1 John 2, verse 15 through 17, Love not the world, 
neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life are not of the Father, but are of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But whoso doeth the will of God abideth for ever. Are you doing the will of God with your diet and your daily living for him? My friend, the world will rob you of your energy that belongs to God alone. If your flesh is not subdued through a steady diet and devotion to the King James Bible, you don't have a prayer of glorifying God in your body and spirit which are God's possession. That is, if you are saved. If you don't belong to a church that honors God and His Word, you are incapable of obeying the commands of God's Word. Incapable. It ain't happening, my friend. Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse 21. Hear now this, O foolish people, and without understanding, which have eyes and see not, which have ears and hear not. Fear ye not me, saith the Lord? Will ye not tremble at my presence, which have placed the sand for the bound of the sea by a perpetual decree, that it cannot pass it? And though the waves thereof toss themselves, yet can they not prevail. Though they roar, yet they, yet they cannot pass over it. But this people hath a revolting and rebellious heart. They are revolted and gone. God's people. Neither say they in their heart, Let us now fear the Lord our God, that giveth rain, both the former and the latter, in his season. He reserveth unto us the appointed weeks of the harvest. Your iniquities have turned away these things, and your sins have withholden good things from you. For among my people are found wicked men. They lay wait as he that set his snares. They set a trap. They catch men. As a cage is full of birds, so are their houses full of deceit. Therefore they are become great and are waxen rich. They are waxen fat. They shine. Yea, they overpass the deeds of the wicked. They judge not the cause, the cause of the fatherless. Yet they prosper, and the right of the needy do they not judge. Shall I not visit for these things, saith the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? A wonderful and horrible thing is committed in the land. Here it is. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their means, not by the power of God. And listen, and my people love to have it so. And what will ye do in the end thereof? My friend, you better go back and read 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and consider the judgment seat of Christ. That's where all children of God will be judged by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We need to consider our daily walk with the Lord. We need to consider walking in the light as he is in the light and having fellowship with him. And my friend, if you've never been saved by his amazing grace, I beg you before time runs out to repent and receive him as your Lord and Savior. And may the Lord bless you and have a good day.